Welcome to the Deep Dive. Where are your shortcut to being well-informed, maybe with a surprising fact or two along the way? Glad to be here. Today, we are plunging into a story that's, well, it's right at the intersection of global health, international politics, and that constant push for scientific discovery. Exactly. Imagine this, a huge multi-million dollar research project, super critical for tackling a global health crisis, right? And suddenly, poof, a massive hole appears in its budget. Yeah, not just a small cut, but like the whole funding stream, gone. Totally gone. Funds that were already promised. So how do you even begin to fill that gap, especially when the work affects millions of lives? And who steps up? What does that tell us about, you know, how global science actually works together? That's exactly what we're going to unpack for you today. Precisely. And understanding sort of the mechanics of who funds this vital medical research is, well, it's more critical than ever. Yeah. especially with ongoing challenges like HIV and TB. Mm. So we're diving into some really significant recent shifts in international funding, so mm. specifically for HIV and other crucial medical research. And we're focusing particularly on South Africa, yeah. a key player in this fight. Right. And the information we're drawing on today, it comes from a recent article that details these exact funding changes. It uses reports from places like Bloomberg and 360 Mozambique, so pretty solid sources. Definitely. Our mission for this deep dive is, well, it's pretty clear. We want to break down how these major funding cuts are being handled. Who are the maybe unexpected players stepping up? Yeah, who's filling those gaps? And what do these rapid changes actually mean for the life-saving research that's happening right now all over the world? We're aiming to distill the key info for you. Give you the core nuggets, basically. Okay, so let's unpack the core issue first, this funding gap. We're talking really significant cuts, hit critical medical research hard. Yep, left scientists, public health folks, everyone kind of scrambling. It wasn't a gradual thing either, was it? It was sudden, yeah. really impactful. That's a key point. The specifics are uh, pretty stark, actually. It shows how fragile these funding pipelines can be, even the big ones. So what happened exactly? Well, the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, a, you know, a huge global donor in health, mm -hmm. for decades, it was shut down this year, 2025. Shut down, like completely? Completely, not just restructured. Operations ceased. And because of that, a large chunk of the money they had already committed was just canceled. Wow. Which had immediate direct consequences for tons of research programs. Oh. Projects that had active U.S. grants, many of them planned for several years, suddenly found themselves, well, high and dry. Right in the middle of their work, I imagine. Often, yes. Midstream. And to make this real, not just abstract numbers, there's a specific example that really hits home, right? There is. Dr. Glenda Gray, she's a very well-known figure in global health, mm. leads a major HIV vaccine trial. Okay. It's a huge project run by the South African Medical Research Council, mm -hmm. this NARC. They're a cornerstone of health research there. And her project, obviously critical stuff for global health, it had USAID funding. It did. Yeah. A big grant. Yeah. Secured back in 2023, multi-year. We're talking U.S. $45.6 million. $45 million. That's substantial. Huge. And it wasn't just for South Africa. It was intended for work across eight different African countries. So a massive scope. And then USAID shut down. And that entire U.S. $45.6 million grant. Right. Gone just vanished. Oh my goodness, that's devastating. It's not just numbers, is it? It's a direct threat to progress against HIV. Absolutely. It yeah. really makes you think, how do you possibly recover from a financial hit like that? Especially mid-trial. Yeah, a complex multi-site trial too. It really is sobering. Shows how linked everything is in global health funding and right. how vulnerable vital projects can be to, you know, big geopolitical shifts. But the story doesn't end there, which is the interesting part. Exactly. What's fascinating is the response. It was proactive and remarkably collaborative. The South African government didn't just sort of wait around for someone else to fix it. They stepped up themselves. They did. Acted quickly. Launched a bold new initiative. And importantly, they partnered up with two massive global players in philanthropy. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. Wow. Okay. So a powerful coalition forming there. A strategic move. Not just a temporary fix but aimed at securing the future of this research. And together, what kind of commitment are we talking about? Really substantial amount, 600 million rand, which works out to about uh, US $33 million. 33 million US dollars, that's significant. It is, and it's not just a general pot of money. It's specifically designed as an emergency lifeline ah. to keep essential medical research going. 
especially projects targeting diseases like HIV and TB, tuberculosis, making sure they can continue without interruption. So a direct intervention to stop things collapsing. Let's um let's break down who's contributing what, because that breakdown is interesting in itself, isn't it? It shows a different model, maybe. Absolutely. What really jumps out is the leadership from the South African government. They put in the biggest share, a very impressive 400 million rand. That's about U.S. $22.2 million, and it's yeah. spread over three years. Okay, so a major national commitment. Huge. It's not just the money. It shows a real commitment to their own research capacity and contributing globally that kind of domestic investment, crucial for the long haul, for scientific sovereignty too. And then the foundations came in to complement that. Exactly. You have the Gates Foundation, obviously a giant in global health, chipping in 100 million rand. That's around U.S. $5.5 .5 million. Okay. And the Wellcome Trust, another major global foundation focused on health research, matched that. Another 100 million rand, so another U.S. $5.5 .5 million. Right. And you mentioned this funding is targeted. Very targeted. The CMRC made it clear. This money is specifically aimed at supporting the research and academic institutions that had those active U.S. grants, the ones hit hardest by the USA withdrawal. So it's plugging the most critical gaps first direct relief. Precisely. It's not just a broad cash injection. It's focused support. And this brings us right back to Dr. Gray's situation, I guess. It does. Her reaction really shows the immediate relevance of this new funding pool. She actually said, and I'm quoting here, we're going to apply and hope to secure some of the funding. So real researchers right now are actively going after these funds. Yes. It shows this isn't just abstract talk or pledges for the future. It's about teams on the ground with complex trials underway, needing this money now to keep going. It's a genuine lifeline. Okay, so here's where it gets really interesting, I think, and maybe a bit surprising for some listeners. South Africa's role in all this, it's pivotal, isn't it? Absolutely pivotal, often underappreciated. When we talk about these funding shifts, the response, it's not just about the money. It's hugely about where that money is going and who is doing this critical work. That's a crucial point. And it really explains why South Africa is in such a unique position in global health. I mean, think about the context. The HIV prevalence? Yeah, the sobering reality. Yeah. Around 13% of South Africa's population, that's out of 62 million people, are living with HIV. That's a massive public health challenge. Immense. But perhaps ironically, it's also positioned South Africa as a world-leading hub for research into STIs, HIV, and also other diseases common in developing nations like TB. Why is that? Just the patient numbers. That's part of it. A large, diverse patient population is invaluable for clinical trials, you see. But it's more than that. They've spent decades building really strong research infrastructure, right. developing world-class scientific expertise. They have dedicated research institutions, established clinical trial sites. It's a whole ecosystem. So their commitment, their leadership here, it's not just about helping themselves. It has global importance. Absolutely vital for global health efforts. This isn't just filling a gap left by, you know, a foreign uh, aid cut. Yeah. It's about recognizing and strengthening a globally significant center of excellence for this kind of research. It almost sets a powerful example, doesn't it, for other nations, maybe particularly in the global south? I think so. It shows how local leadership, combined with smart international partnerships, can really drive essential science forward. Which does make you wonder, what does this signal for the future of global health research, especially if or when traditional funding sources get shaky or change direction? Yeah, it's a question with ripples far beyond just HIV or TB research. So let's connect this to the bigger picture then. What are the main takeaways here? Well, I think this whole episode, this event, it really highlights just how fragile and also how interdependent international medical research funding is. Hmm. It's a stark reminder, isn't it? that even big, established, multi-year grants from major players can just evaporate surprisingly quickly. Leaving critical projects and the people they serve really vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. And that points to the absolute need to build diverse funding streams, robust international partnerships. You can't just rely on one big source, no matter how reliable it seemed in the past. Too risky. Too risky. To keep vital research going, especially for diseases that, you know, don't care about borders, we need a mix, mm. a mosaic of funders and collaborators. And the research itself is often complex too, right? The source mentioned co-infections. Right. Good point. It touched on that. A lot of this research isn't just looking at HIV in isolation. It often involves related health challenges like TB happening in the same person, co-infections. Which makes that diversified, sustainable support even more critical, I suppose, for treating the whole person, the whole picture. Precisely. 
for holistic, effective health solutions. You know, it strikes me that this story isn't just about the money, even though those are big numbers we've been talking about. No, it's definitely more than that. It feels like a testament to, I don't know, the adaptability, the yeah. resilience of science itself and the global health community. I agree. It really underscores the dedication of the researchers, people on the front lines who, despite these huge sudden setbacks, just keep pushing forward with life-saving work. Yeah. And this response, led by South Africa, boosted by Gates, supported by Welcome, that's a pretty powerful kind of inspiring example, actually. Oh. It shows how the global effort against devastating diseases like HIV can find new ways, can innovate, adapt, even when faced with massive unexpected hurdles. It's about collective problem solving, finding new paths through partnership. When one door closes, another one opens, maybe through sheer will and collaboration. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Ingenuity and partnership. Okay, so wrapping this up, what we've really dug into today is this powerful example of how New partnerships, backed by serious financial commitments, are stepping in to fill critical gaps, particularly in HIV research and other medical fields. Mm -hmm. And we see this happening in key places like South Africa, especially after these major unexpected shifts in older funding models. It's definitely a changing landscape. Constantly evolving. But it seems like resilience, maybe some self-determination, and definitely strong collaboration are, well, they're pushing back against some pretty big challenges. You are. And maybe this whole situation leaves us with a final thought, a question perhaps for everyone listening to consider. Cool one. In this world that's always changing, where we maybe can't always count on traditional funding being stable, mm -hmm. how do we as a global community actually ensure we have the sustained funding, the political will, the collaborative spirit we need to tackle health challenges that affect all of us, that cross all borders? Mm, that's a big question. It is. Think about the resilience of research itself and the roles different players have. Governments, big foundations, maybe even individuals collectively. What's the best way forward, do you think? The most sustainable, the most ethical way to secure a healthier future for everyone. A really vital question to chew on. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive today. My pleasure. We hope this gave you a clearer picture of these critical developments and maybe sparked some further curiosity. Definitely keep that curiosity going.